Welcome. Welcome to today's State of the Arts conversation. This is a collaboration between KERA's Art and Seek and the Greater Denton Arts Council. I'm Jerome Weeks, the Senior Arts Producer Reporter with KERA's Art and Seek, and we'd like to thank the Council and its director, Georgina Ngozi, for helping us put together this conversation, and of course, for the three exhibitions currently at the Greater Denton Arts Council. All three exhibitions uh, reflect people's experiences through this past year and a half, not just COVID, but through racial justice protests and the winter storm. And I'd like to begin with, by introducing our panelists today. Uh, Jennifer Bates is the exhibitions coordinator for the Greater Denton Arts Council. For 10 years, she's worked on exhibition designs and development for art centers, presidential libraries, international diplomacy centers, and local history museums. She has degrees from Baylor University, uh, George Washington University, and is working on a degree at Texas Christian University. Welcome, Jennifer. Kathy Brown is an assistant professor in the Department of Art Education at UNT. The fabric piece that's included in the exhibition, it Clothes You Can't Remove, pre and post Brianna Taylor, was accepted to the 2021 Materials Hard and Soft International Contemporary Competition. Welcome, Kathy. And Trina Muir studied graphic design and photography in England and currently works as a professional designer and art director in North Texas. She also owns her own portrait photography business, TM Imagery. Welcome, Trina. And Stephen Suras is an English professor at Texas Women's University. He teaches American literature. He's also the producer of Professor's Corner, a literary discussion group at the Denton South Branch Library. Welcome, panel. Thank you for doing this. And I'd like to start with a, a quick question that uh, for each of you to address. And that is, uh, considering our topic, um, it seemed to be a good idea to start with something uh, counterintuitive, uh, something that perhaps we don't often hear. And that is, has anything beneficial in this past year and a half uh, come out of it uh, for you, either personally, uh, helping you concentrate on your artwork, or uh, any sort of uh, general social or, or cultural change? And uh, we'll go alphabetically. We'll start with uh, Jennifer. Hi, y'all. So I um, joined a lot of boards this past year. I found that because the meetings were on Zoom, I could be more um, participatory in boards that were in Dallas. I've paneled with churches in Maryland. Um, so I've been able to create deeper connections that before I hadn't, I hadn't been able to because of geography. And it's shown me a lot about um, what our community can do to be better, and the things that we're already doing great that we should be sharing with other communities around the country. Thank you. Kathy. Yes, um, I hope you guys can hear me. Yes, um, so it, I, there were many actually great things that came out of it, and I would say the main thing was that it reignited my art practice because I had been on hiatus from making, and it not only reignited it, it reimagined it, sort of as uh, not only art practice, but art praxis, like in the idea of reflection plus action, and as an artivist or artivism in the phrase of uh, two researchers, uh, Pamela Lawton Harris and Gloria Wilson. So definitely reignited my practice and praxis. Thank you. Uh, Trina. Um, yeah, one thing I found really beneficial was um, having more time to focus on quality of life, you know, since I didn't have to commute back and forth to work, um, it really freed up a lot of time. So I started um, cooking and exercising more, as well as reaching out to um, different family and friends and really strengthening those relationships. Um, so I'm really grateful for that time to readjust my priorities and, you know, really focus on what's important in life. Thank you. And finally, Stephen. Well, I'm an English professor. I lead a rather secluded life, a kind of ivory tower existence. Because of the panic buying caused by the pandemic, I found myself in a situation that I'd be more likely to read about in a literary text than actually experience it directly myself. I got a poem out of that moment at CVS in front of the hand sanitizer shelf. And uh, the pandemic has resulted in a burst of creative activity by many other poets, which gives me as a teacher of literature an entirely new body of material to share with my students. Thank you. 
Before we go any further, I'd like to point out to those of us who are watching on Facebook or on Art and Seek, uh, you can join the conversation. Um, you can leave questions or comments, and we will get to them as we can, perhaps um, uh, at the end of our, our conversation. But Stephen, you mentioned uh, your poem, and I thought we would begin with that. If you could um, read it uh, about the encounter at CVS. The poem's called Encounter at CVS, March 2020. We meet by chance at the shelf for hand sanitizer, two strangers in a pandemic foraging for survival tools. It's the shelf for two ounce vials, the kind you always want readily available. Only five are left. She hesitates, looking at me. I hold back, looking at her. Suddenly, she snatches four and walks quickly away. So I um, have to ask, you mentioned it earlier, this was a, an actual experience that you uh, did this encounter at CBS. Uh, this actually happened. I am the speaker of this poem. It is not an invented persona. So what, what about that event inspired you? I mean, we've all gone to, I think we've all gone to grocery stores and pharmacies and found, you know, the shelf is empty, that kind of thing. Well, there was an immediacy, an immediacy uh, about the, the experience or rawness that, that I found startling. Um, frankly, the poem kind of wrote itself, even as I was in the middle of the experience. Uh, Robert Frost said, everything written is as good as it is dramatic. I tried to capture the drama of the confrontation in my poem. Did you see that as a, tiny, a, a tiny snapshot of the entire pandemic experience? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In, in fact, uh, what I experienced in miniature uh, is what has happened globally with uh, various countries, wealthy countries hoarding supplies, uh, which made other countries less wealthy, unable to, to get any. So, you know, it's, uh, it was in miniature what, what has happened globally. Does your poetry uh, usually address something like that? Take a small fragment of life as, uh, with larger implications, larger ramifications? Uh, not necessarily, uh, but this, I just found myself thrust in, into a situation that um, kind of uh, wrote itself, really. Um, so uh, I, I was, I was um, happy to put that in, in a poem. To uh, zoom out broader now, um, uh, Jennifer, I wanted to ask you, why uh, the name for these three art exhibitions? Where did Soul Art Renewal come from? Yeah, so when we started planning this exhibition last year, um, my boss, my director, Georgina Ngozi, and I were talking about, we really wanted to focus on community and what we need to do as a community to sort of repair ourselves. And we had thrown around the idea of art and soul renewal, soul renewal, um, and I landed on soul art renewal because to me, the, the types of art that we feature in our gallery are works that come from the soul. So poetry is words of the soul that you may not be able to say um, in just like a written paper or photography gives us a window to the soul um, as is often said about, you're seeing what the photographer was seeing at that moment. So it came apart together like, so these are our soul arts. These are the arts that speak to our soul or the message of our souls to one another. And it's a time of renewal. So we were really re focusing on bringing back um, and repairing our own, like ourselves. And so that's where the idea of the title came from. But then why three very different exhibitions? You, you spoke about the one mm -hmm. that combines photography and poetry. Then there's uh, the murals, and then there's a much larger exhibition, uh, public exhibition. So why, from the start, was it always meant to be this? So, I mean, some 80 artists are currently represented yeah. in three uh, exhibitions. So we really wanted to make it an exhibition where as many artists from our community could be a part of it. So all these three exhibitions are all different. They're painters, photographers, there's fi fiber artists, there's clay artists, there's metal artists. We really wanted to show the broadness of how all of our lives are impacted by this. All of us come back to a commonality of a communal story, 
but all of us experienced the pandemic and the other events of 2021, 22. 2020, 2021 in different ways. So we wanted to share as many stories as we could and as many different mediums as we could because our community is as diverse as our artwork is. Now, one of the exhibitions in particular is the commission of, of four murals painted. Uh, why, why murals, why these four? So murals are a really important part of Denton. If you, and especially our area and the downtown area, if you've been to Denton, we have murals everywhere. So this was really kind of like a love letter to our city. Uh, okay, y'all, we love murals. We call ourselves a mural city. Let's really dig into that and show our message of hope and renewal in a language that our community knows. So we asked for artists um, who are all based in our area, if they wanted to come in, they submitted designs. Our themes were unity, hope, community change. Um, and they did a fantastic job painting that on our walls um, in all kinds of ways. Some are a little more tongue in cheek and funny like Erica Tolbert's piece. Some of them are more serious like John Bramblett's piece, but they really do speak to um, community hope and like, recognition of a future out of the pandemic and how we have changed. Out of something um, like um, Tolbert's uh, mural, uh, which is a, a cityscape of, of Denton, um, but it, it, across all three exhibitions, were there things that you saw as recognizably Denton? I mean, so much of this experience has been a kind of collective universal one. Um, yeah. But that you thought spoke directly to Denton. I think we saw a lot of care. I think sometimes like, so there's in the messages in all three exhibitions, there are works that are talking about communities, talking about community care, like caring for our neighbors or caring for ourselves. Like in Tolbert's piece, some of the cats represent actual people who were doing things in Denton, like making masks or mowing lawns for one another. Over in our Meadows Gallery, we have pieces like the ones by Kathy Brown. Um, we have a piece of artwork a young lady made that's a dedication to her father who is a nurse, Emma Copeland's piece. And these are all about caring for one another. And I think that's very Denton in that when things get hard, we take care of one another. We saw that in the winter storm. We saw that with the masks, um, Rose Costumes making masks. So I saw the thread of care across everything, um, which I feel like is a very Denton value. Uh, Jennifer uh, mentioned your work, Kathy, um, and I, I have to ask, um, it's focused on the Breonna Taylor case, uh, uh, the a case of the a police in, in Louisville uh, with a no-knock warrant um, and shooting and, and killing Breonna Taylor. I was wondering, given all the art forms that might be inspired by that, you chose cloth. Now, was, was there anything in particular in that case in all of the the indictments, trials, protests, and everything. Why cloth? Why fabric? That's a good question. Um, Christine, who's the education director at the GDAC, she was kind enough to do a Facebook Live talk with me. And so I said some of these things in the talk and I'll repeat some of it. And I also wanted to thank uh, Jenny for inviting me and for having my work in the show. And I think that fabric, like I talked a little bit about earlier, reimagining my practice. Because of the quarantine, I started sewing again and making masks. And then from the mask, they, it just started, sort of started to morph on its own and the figure started to, to kind of formulate its own. And then as I researched back to my own family heritage, I was working in the style of uh, strip quilting, which is from the Gullah Geechee culture. And so it, it, taught, it, it sort of was the idea of not only was this art making catharsis, but this art making was lineage and it was sort of, of um, triumph in the face of abject, uh, abject sadness or, or rage. So I think that the fabric, as it started to morph into a garment, I think it represented the fact that it was its, its skin. And of course, you can't take it off, even though so the ideas of races and social constructs, that's more so the idea of race the stereotypes applied to race or social constructs. But uh, obviously the skin you can't remove, um, but the stereotypes and things that are applied to you, hopefully we're at a place where we're starting to remove that, but we know that hasn't quite happened yet. So 
fabric just turned out to be the the perfect medium to express what I was trying to say. And uh, I did a male version too that's also in the show. And it's um, honoring Isaac Woodard, who was the death of that, the blinding of Isaac Woodard in 1947 is akin to what happened to George Floyd and that it ignited worldwide change. And because of what happened to him later on, they uh, desegregated the armed forces. So I think it's just this idea that that fabric is both malleable and you're also stitching together sort of Africana cosmology, if that's not too far left. <laughs> but uh, but that was the basis of why I chose fabric. So the clothes- and I got that last quote from Queen Quet. <laughs> so the clothes were, were meant to be expression of identity, the identity that couldn't be removed. Is that fair to say? In a way, uh, in a way, uh, not necessarily identity that can't be removed, but I think sometimes uh, if ideas of like respectability politics, uh, identity politics, and that if you are a certain type of person of color, that you're maybe more accepted or you're, you're not as threatening, but that doesn't seem to keep you from being safe. So even though this young woman was an EMT and by all accounts was a great young lady, she still, what happened to her happened to her and there was no accountability. What what is that uh, piece made of? Uh, it's fabric, different fabrics that I I purchased from from stores, and it's sort of meant to be um, African prints, or some of the fabric is is said to be authentically African. And I just cut it. Like I said, it's called strip quilting. I cut it into strips and kind of uh, juxtapose it together. And um, so it's just different different fabric pieces. And there's also wire entwined into the fabric and there's a zipper. Now you said that this this prompted a, a renewal of your art practice. Had you worked in fabric like this before or was this something new for you? Uh, I've been sewing since I was a child and when I was an art teacher I used to teach my students how to sew but I don't think that I had been making as an artist in uh, textile mediums. I was more so a painter and illustrator um, prior to this. And uh, Trina, um, if you could, uh, the obvious question is to explain your work's title. Um. Yeah, um, so my piece is called um, Conquering Orthopnea. And orthopnea means um, a sense of breathlessness. And it's a medical term that generally describes um, that breathlessness when you're lying down. Um, but I use it a bit more um, to depict um, like the feeling of anxiety, like a suffocating grasp um, that was caused um, with all the uncertainty and uh, you know the fear of the pandemic. Um, it's hard to see in, in the image this size, but what are the, um, the, the structures on the, on the horizon? What are the structures? Yes, what are, what are those? It's hard to tell here. Oh, um, so it's the majority of its trees and then there is a figure of a person on the, on the left-hand side as well. Now, you work in uh, digital art and photography. So how was this created? Is this entirely a digital image or did you? Um, it's multiple photographs um, that I had taken. Um, and then, yes, put together in Photoshop. So there, is this a particular landscape? Um, it's on the Oregon coast. Um, so it's an actual, it's an actual land, uh, coast? Yes, yeah, and then it's, um, incorporated with a, a few different um, ocean pictures um, to create some more of the waves. So the, the, um, the images of a person uh, with, a, with a gas mask, correct? Yeah. And it reflects the uh, fears about breathing because of COVID? Um, yeah, so the central figure is surrounded, um, it kind of shows like choking clouds um, and, and also surrounded by a body of water um, just showing someone standing defiant um, of the world's circumstances and just determined to you know, persevere through all of this. If there hadn't been um, the COVID pandemic and I saw this, I would have thought it was uh, sp specifically an environmental statement. It looks as much about, you know, uh, global warming. Uh, right. Else. If you look really closely, you can see the virus is actually floating in the air. Um, you'd have to probably see uh, a larger image of it. I see, oh, I now see the little dots, yes. 
Yeah, so, and I feel like it's also a representation of um, just being so isolated from everyone else. Um, you know, I live alone, so it's just um, sort of the idea of, you know, complete isolation. And there was a, a moment as well when on the news they were even saying it, you know, don't go outside because we don't know if it's floating in the air and, um, you know, is it okay to be outside and breathe, you know, right in the very beginning of all this, there was such a panic. So I sort of pulled from, you know, those thoughts and the panic that have been on the news at the beginning. This is a question for all of the panelists. Um, in creating these works, what did you think of your role as an artist, uh, as a, a poet, painter, designer? Because you're speaking to uh, something that's affecting a lot of people. And um, did you see this as, I mean, obviously it'd be a personal expression, but did you see this as something that uh, was a cry for help, something that was educational? Um, what did you see as, as your role in this, in creating this work? And was it different from what you do at any other time in your work? And I'll pick on Stephen. Well, like I said before, the poem wrote itself. It, it, I felt like I was in the middle of a poem happening, uh, and I just wrote it down. Um, I, I don't, I don't really think in terms of my responsibility, but uh, it did seem representative. So I was, I was eager to share it, and it's the first thing I thought of when the Greater Denton Arts Council put out this call for for poetry about the pandemic. So. Um, I think it's perceived as representative, and I'm I'm happy to contribute to that. But is is that typically how poems come to you? Is a particular event sort of ignites? You said that you felt you were in a poem. Is sort of the perfect uh, encapsulation. Encapsulation. Is that often how it works for you? Uh, yeah, often I'm just startled by an experience or or an insight. Uh, po poetry doesn't necessarily. Um, come to you if you sit down and say, I'm going to, going to write a poem today. Um, so I just try to take advantage of inspiration when it hits. Sometimes in inspiration is from nature and uh, I get a great image, at, write a haiku uh, based on um, sitting at a uh, campfire at uh, Lake Gray Roberts State Park, for example. I, I have several haiku about that. Um, but sometimes um, the inspiration leads in a different direction. And I have to say, um, some of the most moving poems that I've come across about the pandemic are not exactly uplifting. They're, they're uh, quite uh, bitter and uh, uh, agonizing, uh, a cri de corps. So, you know, I, th I think we need to allow for um, darker expressions in, in art and not just look at the positive. Of course, we need, we need uplifting art, but uh, we also need to allow for uh, the more depressed expressions of creative people. In my classes, um, as an English professor, I, uh, I confess I, I gravitate towards works of literature that are a little darker. Those often are the more interesting ones. Uh, and uh, undergraduates especially, um, push back, you know, they, they think that, that, that I have some kind of personality disorder. Uh, I might, but, uh, it's, you know, um, assigning darker works of literature doesn't indicate a personality disorder. It's just where some of the greatest literature is. Kathy, um, what about you? What did you think of your, your role as an artist, this need to express yourself about this? Actually, uh, that's an interesting question. I had a similar conversation with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Lauren Cross, and we were saying, we were talking, talking amongst ourselves saying, what is the role of the black scholar? Because we see ourselves as in the artist of scholar model, which also comes from Pamela Lawton Harris. And we, we were thinking about, when you think about a, a a writer, I know Stephen is a poet and a writer. When you think about like James Baldwin and his famous quote, you know, to be um, to be African American and to be relatively conscious is to be enraged most of the time and in your work. That's the second part of it. So it's it sort of comes naturally. I think the thought that 
not that every person of color who's an artist has to make a certain type of art because there's a debate about that. But I know for myself, I feel like uh, telling stories is a part of what I what I do, either in writing or in art. So I felt like it was important to not only release sort of the emotions because keeping that bottle inside is dangerous, you know, for anyone, but to to have a way of expressing, to have a way of talking about these things through a visual medium and giving a person a chance to look at your work and say, say if they don't see the title, if they don't see your, your artist statement, say, well, what is, the, what is this about? What is she doing here? And thinking about uh, music that, that I'm a fan of, there's a particular artist named uh, the Fantastic Negroti, Negroti, and he wrote a particular song, a lamentation that was about a suit you can't remove. And that also kind of made me think about, again, with the identity politics. So I think that I felt that my my role or my purpose in this was to, to have a say and to express what a lot of people may be feeling and to do it, again, through sort of the ideas of sort of our uh, different parts of our everyday visual culture and to take them and put them in this form. And Trina, um, what, what was your purpose in creating um, your work about orthopnea? Um, I just really wanted to focus on um, probably feelings that a lot of people were having with the isolation and the anxiety. I, I spoke to a lot of family and friends that I think like we're feeling the same things. Um, so I just thought it was really important um, to depict that. And generally in my work, I sort of build um, dreamlike metaphors. Um, I believe you know art is creating a composition. It's not just creating a composition. I try to create moments in that. Um, so I just tried to really focus on that. Uh, the image is haunting. It looks like it could be a poster for a scary movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to know what those bottles are in the composition. Um, so some of them are actually hand sanitizers. Oh. Again, you have to see it closer. Um, and then other ones are messages in a bottle. Um, and I just put that there more to show, you know, that people were sending messages back and forth. And, um, you know, with a message in a bottle, you just really never know if you're going to hear back or not. Everyone was kind of so in their own panic and chaos that, you know, sometimes you did, sometimes you didn't, or it took a while, or some got lost in translation. So um, that's what those are. That brings up an interesting uh, point about uh, being individuals, solitary uh, artists, uh, isolated. And yet at this moment, we had something extremely rare in our experiences, and that is we had a kind of collective moment. We had a mere universal moment. Uh, it's one of those things where my generation, people will ask, you know, they will remember where they were for the Kennedy assassination, either John F. Kennedy or, or Robert Kennedy. They will ask uh, uh, Martin Luther King assassination or any number of events that everyone was glued to their television sets. This was not a single event. This was a year and a half. Uh, but is, was there a, a, what Trina was saying about speaking uh, to and for uh, a collective, a giant collective audience? that was experiencing something that you normally didn't have. So often I think that the, the artist feels that they may be just talking to themselves. This is so unique. Um, and you hope that other people will share this. You hope that this will have some insight, uh, provide insight in their lives. With this, it's kind of ready-made, isn't it? So I'm asking, what did that feel like? Did that feel any different? That, that I am speaking about something that millions of people are undergoing at this time and continue to undergo. It definitely changed for me as an art curator um, telling the story. So usually if I am putting a show together, I am trying to encourage the artist, tell your individual story so the person in the gallery who may not share that story with you understands what you're saying. So um for like when i'm working with artists i'm in the past has been very much helping them almost translate their story to a broader audience can understand it 
um, if they need that help. Some artists don't, some do. This show, um, there was already a built-in base of understanding for a lot of the experiences. Maybe not every experience and not every person had the same experience. I mean, we see that in the artwork in the exhibition. Um, but everyone experienced COVID in some sort of way, whether it was you didn't work for home because you were a frontline worker, so your life got much more complicated, or you did work from home for a year and a half, or you lost your job. People experience this, or we're talking about like the racial injustice protests. Uh, maybe you didn't attend the protests, but you saw the protest. You heard what people were saying. Um, so these experiences, everyone in the exhibitions who come visit can connect to one part of it. Maybe not every message is for them, but they have some connection that doesn't always happen when you're doing an art show. So that changed how I curated it. Well, case in point, I think that if at any other time um, we had uh, read Stephen's poem, seen uh, Trina's artwork, um, we wouldn't necessarily have understood it as something that happened to me. Um, whereas now you instantly see uh, uh, Trina's character in a, in a gas mask and you know what it's a reference to. The same thing with, with uh, Stephen's poem. Kathy's uh, work, because of the name Brianna Taylor, I think two years ago, it wouldn't ring any bells. But today, of course, people know that name, as they say, say that name. And so that's there's a, a connectivity that uh, I think many artists would sort of dream of, that it would have that instant communication mm -hmm. with people's lives. And in, in, in my poem, I, I put March 2020 right under the title, which is supposed to make it obvious what was going on in, in what I experienced. Uh, I, I'd like to say something about the exhibit because uh, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to bring works of art created in isolation together where there can be a, a, a kind of dialogue between those works which is discovered and experienced by the viewer. So the viewer actually uh, activates that, that dialogue between the works of art. I'd like to mention just a couple things from the uh, photography and poetry exhibit. Trina's Conquering orth not orth Orthopnia is paired with Beth Honeycutt's poem at Dance's End. Uh, Trina's uh, uh, image is is defiant. Uh, it's bold, uh, and Beth Honeycutt's uh, poem at Dance's End is more of a meditation about what it means to wear a mask and and never take it off, as opposed to uh, wearing a mask at a dance where you reveal yourself uh, afterwards. Uh, and she talks about uh, how. Uh, everyone wearing masks cr cr makes everyone a little androgynous then um, but but you have to stand there and look at the two and think about how they actually enter into a kind of dialogue then let's uh, look at um, uh, Kathy's two photos called enclosure those are on the wall together but in the middle in between those two there's a poem by Emily Ramser called How to Make Candied Lemons in Quarantine. Um, so uh, Kathy's uh, images called Enclosure are, are kind of depressing. It's more of a, a representation of the sober aspect of the pandemic. Uh, and Emily Ramser's poem is like, uh, if you're given a lemon, make lemonade, you know? Um, and. And then it, it somewhat undercuts itself at the end by saying, well, you've made this, uh, this thing now in the kitchen, but hmm, you're actually all alone. You can't share it with anyone. And then finally, um, I'll point out that my poem is flanked by uh, one of uh, Kathy's enclosure photographs where the figure is lying face down on the bed. That's on the left side. And then on the right side, uh, we have... Um, uh, Renee Miles' shadow on on that side. So um, three three works of art there that all represent the the darker side of the pandemic. So I just want to uh, praise the work of of the uh, exhibit organizers in thoughtfully arranging these pieces, inviting viewers to come and and uncover that dialogue. 
Jennifer, you spoke earlier about the, uh, the way poems and uh, photos uh, worked together. Um, but what Stephen's talking about is actually the, the layout, selecting which poems with which photos. Right. So um, that was the hardest part of that installation was figuring out. Because so usually, and sometimes when you do a call like we did for this show, we knew from the beginning we were going to put them in conversation. I knew I wanted the literary arts to speak to the visual arts because you don't see a lot of literary art in museums on walls. And we were inspired by the Visual Arts Society of Texas and Denton Poets Assembly's Merging Visions exhibition. Um, but ours is different in that. The poets didn't work with the photographers. That like, okay, my poem's going to be next to your photo. Um, I put them together during installation. Oh, we seem to have lost, lost her. Oh, there we go. Oh, you're back. We're back. Sorry, my screen went black for a second. Um, but to continue, kind of going back to saying so, and unlike merging visions where the artists have conversations before. The photographers and the poets did not have conversation together. Um, I put them together based on reading the poems and based on the artwork and tried to sort of create a narrative and a story, but I also wanted the audience to um, do this, do it, the work themselves. So I could put the works, like Stephen was saying, on the wall together, but I'm requiring the audience members to think and to think about what's the connection here. Why is the poem New Ceremonies, which is about um, experiences in COVID and new events and experiencing them in new ways, next to a poem of a graduation scene at Texas Motor Speedway? What is the commonalities between these? What's the story that's being told? Um, and sometimes they don't always perfectly work together. Sometimes there's extra thinking involved, um, but I try to be as, um, helpful as I could, but I'm also always trying to get my audience to think. I don't want to just put artwork on a wall and have people have a very um, like viewer appreciation. I want people to experience it. Um, so and it's like that in the Meadows Gallery, which is the 3D show Kathy Brown's piece is in. Um, all the pieces are, are laid out purposefully. They are um, telling a story together. There's a bunch of images that are works that are all about mental health and experiences of mental health in the pandemic. Some of the experiences are, um, one section is all landscapes and what did we see in the pandemic? So usually um, if I'm doing a show, it's not just, oh, I just put this on the wall because I like this piece here. It's these works are in communication with each other and what story can we tell that makes each artwork stand out? What's gonna make Trina's poem, uh, Trina's photograph stand out? What poem is going to make her photograph look better? And what is her photograph going to support? What poem will sound better while you're looking at her image? For those of us, uh, for those of you who may have been joining us uh, late, this is the State of the Arts Conversation. Uh, we're having about three shows currently at the Greater Denton Arts Council uh, called Soul Art Renewal. All three uh, address experiences of the past year and a half uh, from the uh, COVID uh, pandemic through uh, racial justice protests and even the winter storm. And our panelists uh, are three artists from that exhibition and the curator uh, from the, the show, uh, Jennifer Bates. If you uh, want to uh, participate in the conversation, feel free to um, ask questions or make comments. You can do that uh, via uh, Art Mystique or on Facebook. I want to get uh, back to you, uh, Jennifer, uh, because I was talking about the, the kind of universality of, of many of these experiences. And that was some of the intention behind that open public exhibition to get to gather as many. I was wondering if you could talk about the, that range of submissions, um, the diversity of, of, of people, of professionals to youngest amateurs. Yeah, so when we put the call out, um, we were very intentional in that one, the call would be free. There would be no cost to enter the artwork because we didn't want to create an economic disadvantage to any artists. Um, and then our other point of it is we didn't put an age. So we didn't have to say, you have to be 18 or older or you have to be a professional artist. Um, and we didn't limit the medium either. The only exception was it had to be under 75 pounds um, for safety reasons. 
Um, so those were those were the rules basically. It had to be made in during so between 2020 and 2021. Um, and people really responded to that. They really felt that they had something to say and being so broad allowed them to say things. They weren't constrained to, well, it just has to be about um, COVID or it just has to be about the winter storm. It really allowed people to tell their story, um, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to, this to be an exhibition of storytelling of individuals' experiences that created the communal experience. Um, so we have artworks in here that are, there's a piece by a young artist named Emma Copeland. Um, I believe it's Emma Claire Copeland. And it's a portrait of a teddy bear nurse with a little hat and it's a little just color pencil drawing. And it's representing her father who is a nurse in the area. We've got works by some high school students who, if you saw them, you'd be like, that's the best high school, high school artist I've ever seen. So they're just, the talent is amazing. And we have all the way up to professional artists like Harlan Butt, who has been a metalsmithing professor at UNT and retired, and who is well known internationally for his metalsmithing. And I think it adds to showing the variety of the of the experience. It wasn't just artists who were impacted by this. It was everyone who felt this. And it also it adds the idea that everyone could be an artist. I know that's kind of some people are like not everybody can be artists, but. It adds the idea of, if we're saying what an artist is, is a person who uses an art medium or uses clay or paint to tell a story. Everyone that's expression is an artist. Everyone told their story through some sort of artwork. And I think that was really powerful. Um, and we see it here in the variety of the works we have of the artists represented on our screen. We have poets, photographers, fiber artists, they're all telling their own individual experiences and stories from the past year and a half in their own ways, but it all feeds back into a, the experiences our community had. Now, with the uh, uh, the exhibition we spoke of earlier, you specifically wanted a kind of dialogue between um, photographs and, and, and poems. And the, the muralists were given kind of a, a commission to, to work in, in these areas. With this, how do you organize an exhibition that varies from an eight-year-old to a you know, long-experienced artist in any medium about anything that happened in the past year? How did you, I mean, were there themes, general sorts of issues, or how did you, how did you try to uh, make sense of this? So I did organize it by theme a little bit. Um, so if you walk into the exhibition gallery space, all the works on the right side of the wall when you enter the doorway are all about um, self-discovery in COVID. So it's self-discovery of identity, self-discovery of mental health, um, how we responded to mental health problems we may have already had, of how we changed how we view ourselves um, when we realized that I don't have to do a performance of anything because no one's around. How do you deal with the isolation after being a year? Um, you start to realize, oh, I was joyful and funny because I like to make people laugh. But now that I've been alone for a year, maybe I don't like being funny. Maybe funny isn't what I want to be. Um, or maybe the group mom, if anyone gets, knows what that means, like if you're always taking care of other people, what does it mean when you're not taking care of other people anymore because you're alone? So that's what those images on the right side are about. As you come around in the gallery through the left side, there are some pieces that um, are landscapes and animals. And I kind of wanted to talk about more of what did we see in the pandemic? When we did go outside, did we see animals? Did we see birds? Did we see squirrels? Did we, when did we go outside? One of the images is a nightscape theme um, by Aurora Isabella and it's titled, um, it was nice to feel the wind on my face. And it's it's her walking at night in the pandemic because it's kind of like, I didn't feel safe going out any other time. So here's our here's an area, maybe I wouldn't have been outside at night before, but I just wanted to get outside when I felt safe. And then as you come around, there's a couple of pieces that are about um, the pro protests and the social unrest. Jose Angel Hernandez's piece and Kathy's pieces are about um, identity and protests and how do we be in community with one another and what does the individual mean in the communal space. And then if you come around to kind of the end of the exhibition, it's abstracts that still talk about 
the past year, but the more and the more abstract way they give you more thoughts of like either isolation as an abstract concept or um, putting things together as an abstract concept, like restructuring things. So that's kind of how the exhibition is laid out. It's also um, color. So in these themes, I put pieces that look nice together, color wheel and examples of, you know, different kinds of arts. So the metal pieces are kind of close together. So you can see the range of Harlan's piece and Jay Su's piece um, are both metal, but very different styles of metal. So, um, getting back to the uh, point I made earlier about the universality of, of the, the collective experiences that we've been going through this past year, I just thought I'd quiz the the panel. Um, you can uh, raise your hand on this. How many of you? Which of you have known anyone who has um, died of COVID or came down with it seriously? And three. Um, do any of you know someone who has been racially profiled by the police? Three, four, five. Um, did any of you lose heat and power during the winter storm? That's funny, I was expecting the universal response on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I did lose internet. I had power and heat, but I just colored because there wasn't really much to do without the internet. <laughs> and I, I wasn't in town, so that's the only reason why I didn't experience it. <laughs> I talk about universal experience. I uh, will remember that winter storm because I actually had to go out in the middle of it and ended up helping two neighbors turn off their water because their houses were, were flooding because of uh, uh, the ice had broken the pipes. And so I didn't know either one of them until I had done that. Um, I started with one and they saw, the other people saw us working on that, on the, the shutoff valve. And uh, it was one of the, it was, it was surprising to me in a way. It's what it takes for, for me to know my neighbors, uh, to meet my neighbors. It's kind of an uh, insane disaster. Uh, so I, I was just curious it's about just how universal this was. Um, I'm seeing people on the news uh, occasionally say, I don't know anyone who's had COVID. I don't know anyone who died of COVID. And that really kind of surprises me because uh, it's not like I have a wide range of, of friends and fellowship, but, but I know uh, three people uh, offhand who came down with it very seriously. Uh, and even if you didn't know anyone, um, what Stephen talks about is, I think, a, in his poem, is a near universal experience. I don't know anyone who hasn't had that uh, experience in the past year of going to a store and witnessing the hoarding uh, or seeing the results of it. Um, and it really, um, in very different ways, getting to know your neighbor, helping them, but also getting to know what, what your fellow citizens are, are capable of. Uh, it points in two very different understandings of, of human nature. And I was wondering uh, to circle back to the, the uh, my first very first question about anything beneficial coming out of this. Um, I was wondering if you had any further thoughts about that, considering our conversation, that uh, considering this exhibition and the expressions in it, um, what do they say about um, enduring this past year and a half? I think if I may say something, if I may jump in, I yes. think it's a, uh, I know that maybe sound cliche, but sort of a testament to the human spirit. The fact that all of these artists, you know, submitted to the show and if everyone has a different perspective and a take on a collective event, I think is, is important. And I think that um, because they have done this, that it speaks to the need for expression. It speaks for the need to kind of release all of the things that we all went through at this this sort of moment of calamity. One of the things that I was surprised in seeing so, well, not surprised, but struck by in seeing so much of the artwork was that uh, people were actually able to express something in a coherent and recognizable fashion. Uh, because so much of it, it seems to me that, that would drive us into isolation or into expressions of just rage. Um, of just incoherent, I can't believe this is happening. Um, and yet 
repeatedly these artists found something, a, a way to say, a way to craft something. Um, which, what, in a way, what you were saying, uh, Kathy, about the, the human experience, that uh, people felt the need to express themselves in a particular way in, the, in this particular moment. And if you were lucky I, enough to make it through, like all of us here, you know, yeah. because like you said, people did pass away, and I do know people that got really sick as well. So the fact that we're all alive to tell the tale as we move to the other side of it, I think is a, obviously a historical moment that we're all kind of in the middle of. Steve, I'd like to direct attention. Yeah, there seems to be some latency uh, here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'd like to direct attention to a poem in the exhibit by Ellie Gonzalez Stone. Uh, where she, she uh, ends with an incredible affirmation that I think is representative of many uh, poems that came out of this experience. The final lines, um, here are the final lines. We must breathe life into ourselves and find the will to overcome what has foreshadowed us for so long. We must courageously find that courage to become our own hero, to prevail and be victorious to stand and remember how to love, be loved, to extend a hand to another and hold on tightly, not just to feel human again, but to save ourselves and humanity. That's very stirring. So that is uh, her poem titled, So Many Questions. And then, um, if I may, I'd, I'd like to uh, refer to Clint Wyatt's poem, Falling Fallow, which is also in the exhibit. And he ends with an extraordinary stanza of affirmation. Uh, can I read that? Go ahead. Okay. He says, let society beware once we're reborn, a monster unseen since before we painted on cavern walls. In that day, our songs will be howls and our poems will be unformed chants in worship of a vast round goddess giving birth as she devours. When we wake up, we too will be hungry and horny and the city gates will not hold against our rampage. One of your darker expressions that you, you're drawn to. <laughs> not dark at all, just incredibly bold and, and uplifting. In the, the lead up to this, this panel, I, I posted a number of things on, on Facebook because I was researching uh, artistic expressions that uh, around the 1918 flu epidemic, which so far, far exceeds the deaths that have happened in COVID. Uh, we're talking 50 million worldwide. And I was struck by how little there was. And then people started writing back saying, well, you forgot this, you missed this, that kind of thing. Um, and there are, for instance, uh, uh, something by Edvard Munch um, of, of, of him yeah, w with the flu, suffering from the flu and having survived the flu. And I had completely forgotten them. They're actually relatively famous self-portraits and devastated by it. Um, Egon Schill, another uh, artist from the, from the era, um, he painted uh, Gustav Klimt, his, his uh, inspiration, who uh, died, of, uh, died of it. But the, uh, the single most famous and best known depiction of the flu pandemic was probably from a Texan, Catherine Porter's short story, Pale Horse, Pale Rider. Um, and a, a young woman comes down with the flu, just as Porter did. But when she recovers, when she's uh, awake, finally, and conscious, the young man whom she had become attracted to, had gotten to know, he had died while she was unconscious. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting to me to see the contrast between those works, which are of devastation and loss, uh, and the works that we find here which often do are, are often forward looking, are often seeing this is a moment of a personal revelation of, but also of social change. Um, that, I didn't get any of that in the, uh, the newspaper uh, illustrations, any of that, that sense. It was more what you'd expect, the kind of you know, skeletons and the, the, the warnings, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but that, that first of the two poems that, that you read from Stephen, there was an incredibly stirring call. Um, and I had never seen that so far, uh, 1918 from the epidemic. I wonder if part of that comes from our like advancements in science almost, because like at, in 1918, there was the thought of like, 
what if this never ends? There was no, I don't know how hopeful it was. What if this was the pandemic that the plague that wiped out the world? Um, and like you didn't have the hope of a vaccine. You didn't know if scientists were working on a vaccine right away. And now, depending on who you ask and where you live, I feel like that's still the feeling of uncertainty of when this will end. Like in areas of like India and other countries where this is still ravaging the country. I wonder if their works are hopeful or if they're more reflective of the 1918 items. And here in the US, since we were always like, oh, well, science will fix this. We'll have vaccines soon. Um, that we kind of forced ourselves to look forward because we were trying to get out of the depression. Um, but also, I think we're forgetting that for a lot of people in our communities who can't get vaccinated, that this pandemic isn't over. Like it was over for me and that I can go outside because I've been vaccinated by have friends who are like, I can't come with you to these things. And I don't know when I'll be able to because I can't get vaccinated. So like, I think there is a, a luckiness here in the US that we can see the end. Um, that is a point of privilege for us. That is important to point out. I um, mean, our work, I think, reflects that. Um, so that's just- I think that's a very important, a very important point, the difference. They never did find a vaccine for the flu epidemic. For the 1980s. They never did. It simply passed on. Um, and and uh, yet, from the very beginning, we were you know, ginning up the, the whole system, the, the scientific pharmaceutical industry, to, to do something when we expected it. Um, at the time, in 1918, there was no such thing. Um, you're quite right. I think there was, as, as bad as it was, there was always that sense of, well, this will, we'll find a solution. We'll we just need to manage this. Um, and that must have made a, a profound difference uh, in terms of the experience of the illness, um, culturally, socially, personally. And I would even say even with the vaccine in some communities of color, it's well known that there's still a mistrust. So that's still something that is being sort of battled against in order to win people over to to even go to the vaccine, even though it's available to you historically, um, the, the healthcare system has not been kind to everyone. I interviewed, a, a, we interviewed a, a theater goer, an arts goer actually recently, who uh, pointed out that you know, uh, at the time, this is a couple of weeks ago, more than 40% of Texans had not received a single COVID shot still now. Whereas uh, New York celebrated the fact that they had 70% um, and California has more than that. Um, so that, yeah, it, uh, uh, to Jennifer's point, for many people, this is, isn't over at all, um, which is kind of a, a, a grim uh, note to be winding up on. But it, it, seems, uh, it, it seems that that is very much the, the case um, for, for some of us. Um, uh, that we're very fortunate, I suppose, to count our blessings. That I have you know, both vaccination shots, and most people I know do, but 40% of Texans haven't, haven't gotten one. I'd, I'd like to mention just very briefly that there's a, a website that has collected poems about the pandemic from Texans. It's called TejasCovido.com, TejasCovido.com, uh, and there's just a, a wonderful array of poems there by Texans about their experience during the pandemic. And I'll also just mention that there's a wonderful book called Together in a Sudden Strangeness, America's Poets Respond to the Pandemic, edited by Alice Quinn. And it's, a, it's available uh, through Amazon, of course. Um, but some of um, America's most important poets have actually contributed poems. They, they put this book together in about 40 days, starting wow. at the end of March 2020. It's just an amazing book published by Knopf. Do you know who's uh, behind the TexasCovidos.com? You know who? Lawrence, yes, Lawrence so. Musgrave. His name is Lawrence Musgrave. You know anything about him offhand? I'm just curious. It's well, he's, he's a, a poet in Texas uh, mm -hmm. and has just done a remarkable job inviting poets from around the state to, um, to write about their experiences. There are some beautiful poems there. It's all on the website, public domain, uh, and I strongly recommend it. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, panelists. Um, this has been uh, very stimulating, very interesting, um, and at times very sobering. Um, I'd like to thank uh, each of you, um, Jennifer Bates, Stephen Soros, Kathy Brown, Trina Muir, and we would like to thank Georgina Ngozi, the director of the Greater Denton Arts Council for helping uh, put this panel together, and of course, helping put together the three art exhibitions. So have a good day. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.